based upon my earlier conversations, I think this is a very friendly group. So um, I'm going to just start with, um, I guess the drinks flowed freely. Uh, I'm going to give a short bio and then tell you about one of the projects in the lab and how it kind of was sponsored by my participation in the Center for Sensory Biology. So I'm Paul Fuchs. I'm a professor of otolaryngology and director of research in that department. Uh, I am the second of 11 children in a German Catholic family. Uh, grew up outside of St. Louis in what was then a small farming community. Now it's a suburb. Uh, and being a goal-directed, ambitious young kid uh, in a Catholic family, I figured, well, the best thing to do is to go into the seminary and plan to become a priest, which I did. So I then spent my high school years and a year of college in a seminary in the Order of the Society of the Precious Blood. And uh, about midway through my freshman year in college, I took a sharp left turn and transferred to Reed College in Portland, Oregon. If any of you know that place, that may raise some questions in your mind about what that involved, but we'll leave that for later discussion. <laughs> Uh, and then uh, at Reed, but Reed was great for me. It really was. It was a fa fantastic place. I eventually majored in biology and then went on from there to get a doctorate in neurobiology at Stanford University. Uh, throughout all that training period, I was very focused on the topic I still study, which is synaptic physiology. I'm really interested in how neurons communicate with one another, the details of those molecular mechanisms, and have been what I call an electro jockey throughout my entire life. I'm an electrophysiologist who likes to look at recordings, electrical recordings. I did a second postdoc in Cambridge, England with a man named Robert Fetty Place, who at that time had decided to use the turtle as an interesting model system to study how the external, how the um, periphery of the auditory system operates. And there's lots of reasons for doing that, but I joined him there and learned from him a lot. And that really turned me in the direction of studying hearing. Initially as a model system to look at synaptic signaling because it's very intriguing, but it turns out there's some really nice other things that impact our own health, of course. Uh, so my laboratory now continues to be centered on synaptic physiology. We look at how signals in the ear are transmitted to the brain. We also look at how signals in the brain are transmitted back to the ear through some efferent neurons, which actually turn our ears off in interesting ways. Uh, today, though, I want to tell you, or tonight, I want to just tell you about one project uh, which springs out of my participation in the Center for Sensory Biology. So two other colleagues there, Jin Jong Dong and Michael Katerina, are outstanding sensory physiologists and molecular biologists, and they study pain and noxious stimulation of somatosensory receptors, pain and itch and temperature sensation. And in our conversations, our chalk talks, our you know, coffee clutches, whatever you want to call it, uh, we were inspired to ask the question, well, maybe there's something that mediates ear pain. And can we learn something from Katerina and Jin Jong Dong about how to study that? So you might be asking yourself, if you're not old enough, uh, what is ear pain? What's there's no such thing. Well, there is. Uh, and some of you that may, like me, have reached the stage of age-related hearing loss where you now know that there are some paradoxical gain-of-function pathologies that go along with hearing loss. One of them is tinnitus. That's pretty famous. Lots of people have ringing in their ears. For some people, it's extremely uh, irritating. But there's also something called hyperacusis, which, again, is paradoxical because you may be less sensitive to quiet sounds but you become much less tolerant of loud sounds. So that things that didn't bother you at all as a young person, now you find are irritating or, in fact, frankly, painful. People with really severe hyperacusis are devastated. They become recluses. They don't go out in society any longer. They become highly depressed. You might imagine there's a lot of very severe morbidities that go along with a situation where you can no longer function in society because too much sound is painful. And when they describe the pain, they describe pain in their ear, which is burning, long-lasting. It sounds like neuropathic pain, the sort of thing that goes, comes along with diabetic neuropathy, for example. So we thought, OK, maybe there's something there that can serve as the substrate for hyperacusis and neuropathic type of pain from the ear. 
And in fact, there's a hint, and people have talked about this for a long time. So if you look at the afferent neurons that carry information from the brain, uh, from the ear to the brain, most of them are large diameter myelinated neurons and they carry acoustic information. They tell us how we hear the world. 5% are very different. They are small diameter, unmyelinated. They have very strange peripheral arbors, which are very different looking. And the very few in vivo recordings that have been made in animal models said that they didn't seem to respond to sound. The loudest sounds that could be produced in the experimental situation didn't really cause these neurons to fire action potentials, to signal. So we thought, OK, let's, take a, let's dive into this. We have some uh, suggestions from our colleagues. Maybe we can learn something from our technologies. And so Catherine Weiss, a graduate student in the department, uh, began to learn how to record from type 2 afferents in excised pieces of the cochlea of a rat or a mouse. And she learned from her work that, indeed, these are very unusual neurons if they're cochlear afferents because they're very poorly activated by transmitter release from hair cells. They do get it, and they do get a little signal, but it's weak. It, it goes along with the idea they may not respond to sound very well at all. What Catherine, or Cat, also found was that they were sensitive to ATP. And so then Chang Lu, another student who took over after Cat left, established that not only are these neurons sensitive to ATP, but if you record from one of these type 2 neurons in this excised piece of tissue and damage tissue causing the release of ATP, which comes out of cells when they're damaged, these type 2 afferents fire like crazy. They respond very strongly to ATP, which is a common mediator of trauma in skin and causes activity of somatic uh, nociceptors. And so at this point, we are pretty happy with the idea that type 2 afferents may be cochlear pain fibers. They may be the substrate by which hyperacusis and tinnitus get started. And so because we are cellular electrophysiologists and we study ion channels and things, we know now what some of the channels are that are operating there. We know what some of the neurotransmitter receptors are that mediate these responses. We know some small molecules that interrupt the activity of type 2 afferents. And so I think we're well on our way to beginning to work out uh, a rational basis for thinking about therapeutic strategies to treat conditions like hyperacusis and tinnitus, because now we know what the cells are, we think, and we're beginning to know what the molecular mechanisms are, and that knowledge springs directly out of my interactions and participation in the Center for Sensory Biology, I'm quite confident we wouldn't be studying this project today if I hadn't had Michael Katerina and Jin John Dong sitting down with me for chalk talks once a month and telling me about their research and me telling them about theirs. So I'll stop there and thank you very much for your attention.